All right, we'll get started here. So last time we met, this came up, nitrogen negative two. Get rid of this. If you have this periodic table, depends on what table you have. I researched this a little bit. I don't know where this negative two come from. On nitrogen, scribble that negative two out. I did a little research on that and I couldn't even find it. So we'll get rid of that negative two. Okay, let's look at quizzes. So I'm going to go in order. They're up there. Chapter 2, 21. Actually, I won't go in order. I'll go in numerical order. So 14. So this is going to be grams to atoms. Now, you should try to follow what we did previously. We have grams and we want atoms. So previously, you want to match that up. And you want to do your homework as soon as possible. So grams, here it is. Grams to moles to atoms. So this should match this example right here. So you're going to go grams to moles to atoms. So if we do this real quick, we'll set it up. Silicon, grams of silicon, one mole. That'll get us two moles. And then one mole, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Please write all the units in there. I got an email from a student. Wanted to know where they went wrong on this post lab quiz. Please put in units for everything and then you'll know where you went wrong because something will not cancel out. Please put in units. So we just got to fill this in. <clears throat> 17, arrange the following in order of increasing mass. Now, one fluorine atom from the periodic table. Fluorine right here on the periodic table, 18.9998, 18.9998. It looks like we'd round that to 19.00, yeah. So fluorine, if it's a single atom, it would be 19.00 AMU. Now, let's get the safest way to do this is to get everything in grams. Get everything in grams. This one is already in grams. If you have one F2 molecule, it's going to be two times 19.00 AMU. And you can convert AMU to grams. You know this one is going to be lighter than this one. AMU. This mole here, you can go one mole of fluorine is 19.00 grams. So probably the best thing to do for that is to get everything in grams. So 14.17. And then 21, calculate the number of carbon atoms in sucrose. Okay, that's the exact last problem we did. Well, actually, calculate the number of carbon, one mole, okay. Looks like this on the very last problem grams to moles to molecules to atoms on the last example but we already have moles so we can start this problem here at one mole so we've got one mole of c12 h22 o11 one mole of c12 h 2211 is going to have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules.
Then one molecule is going to have 12 atoms. Number 22 is like the last example we did. Number 22, the last example we did. What is the percent by mass of nitrogen? Got six nitrogens at 14.01. For the entire molar mass. Part over the whole, the entire molar mass down here. That would be your percent nitrogen. All right, let's switch over to. The other quiz, number 20. So number 20 is, this is an acid, right? MnO4 is permanganate, so we're just going to go eight to eight. Okay, 32. At 32, I actually fixed up 32. I changed it a little bit um, because of the top two, but let's attack this from the bottom. If we do E first, you have N-O-O-O-O. What's the charge of oxide? Always, always, always. Negative two, we've got four of them. That's negative eight. That means nitrogen would have to be a positive eight, right? And that's just garbage. Letter D, you have LIS. What's the charge of sulfide? Sulfide, negative two. That means lithium would have to be a plus two, and lithium is only, only, only positive one. So that's junk. Let's do C. When you do C, You've got COO at negative two, negative two. That would make copper a four. No copper four. Correct? However, however, the O2 can be peroxide. And if this is peroxide, the charge is minus two, and the copper charge is. Plus two would work. This is a valid compound. This is copper two peroxide. Letter B actually works. If you really look everything up, I think letter B actually, letter B does work. I have now changed that. When you open up this quiz, you're going to see a three right there. So it doesn't work. So I changed it. This was the one I was looking for. Uh, so when you see this, I think I changed that to a three or something. So when you put the answers in for this, you're going to see a different number there. Uh, and then 40. 40 is a good question. Here's what we've got. Tin four, manganese seven, citrate. Tin four, manganese seven, and then we've got c 6 h 507 negative three for the citrate, correct? Citrate negative three? Okay. Right now, we've got a plus 11 and a minus three. We know we've got to crank up the negatives, correct? We need more negative, right? So what we're going to do, let's just put parentheses there, put a box there. I need to put a number there to crank it up. There could be a subscript here and a scrub subscript here, and you're trying to just get zero for this. So if I put a three there, I'd have a negative nine, that won't work, right? 
If I put a four there, I'd have a negative 12. Can I get a positive 12 out of these? No. If I put a five there, that gives me negative 15. Can I get a positive 15 by putting ones or twos or threes or fours in these? Yes. Yes. So that will help you finish out number 40. I think I changed the due date to is, are both of these Wednesday night now? And I think I changed, I changed the I'll do date to Wednesday as well, right? Part two. So everything's Wednesday for this. All right, so let's finish this up here. We left off. Did percent on page 13. We did percentage composition when we left off. And now we need to use that information to do empirical and molecular formulas. So this is on page 13. Now, we know that our molecular formula, this is our true formula. Our molecular formula is a multiple of the empirical formula, or said another way, the empirical formula is the reduced, just like you would reduce a fraction, the reduced simplified form of the molecular formula. So if my molecular formula here, 6H6, my empirical formula would be, I'm just going to reduce it. If I have six over six as a fraction, one over one, my empirical formula is just CH. Now, what's my empirical formula for C4H4? Same thing, right? Same thing. I'm just going to divide here. I'm dividing by... I'm dividing by six, I'm dividing by four, so I get CH. And over here, what can I divide by? I can divide by two and I would get C2H3O1. And over here, I can't do anything, it would be the same. What we're going to do is we're going to figure out this multiplier here to go from the empirical to the molecular. So here it's a six, right? It's really a six. Here it's a four. Really, this is what we divided by. Here it's a two. Here it's a one. Okay, here's what we do, four steps for calculating an empirical formula. I am gonna talk about this step four clarification after we just do one. So get grams, convert to moles, divide all moles by the smallest. So we're gonna go right down to the example. Determine the empirical form of iron oxide. We're really trying to figure out the X and we're trying to figure out the Y. We've got 34.97 grams of iron. And 15.03 grams of oxygen. So we already have grams. Step one is to get grams. We already have grams. Step two, convert to moles. 
So we'll convert 34.97 grams of Fe to moles and 15.03 grams of oxygen to moles. So this for sure is going to be one mole of Fe. And so grab the periodic table. What do we get for these? Hopefully you've got oxygen memorized, 16.00, right? 16.00. Then see if you can find iron, 55.85. And my units cancel out, right? So we'll convert to moles and we get point six two six one moles of iron. And here we get point nine three nine four moles of oxygen. So nothing super difficult there, correct? We're just converting grams to moles. So step one, get grams. You'll see where we'll have to get grams in the next example. Step two, convert to moles. Step three, divide all moles by the smallest moles. Or the smallest mole, I should say. And the smallest one here, I grab a different color pen. I just like to do that, is 0.6261 and 0.6261. If we do this, we end up with one mole of Fe and five mole of oxygen. And we know that these have to be whole numbers, right? We don't have Fe101.5. So this is where we have to go up and we have to do step four. Step four says, if not whole number ratios, make them whole number ratios by multiplying all ratios by the least multiplier needed to create whole numbers. So if we ended up with this, I should actually make this 1.5, but if you have 2.5 and three, what are you gonna multiply by? We're gonna multiply by two, right? And then we would end up with C5H6. Have C1.25. Multiply by. Because this is one and one fourth. And that would produce 5H16. And if you have 1.3, we would multiply by three 
because that's one and one third, and we'd end up with C4 each. So if we do step four here, we're simply going to multiply by, right? And we're going to end up with Fe203. Oops. Fe203. All right. Let's go to the next page. And I Al does maybe a quick one like this in the beginning. So it gives us an empirical formula. So we know that this is C4H9. but we don't know the number that that's been reduced by. We have C4H9. But we know the molar mass, so that allows us to get the true molecular formula. So to figure out this multiplier right here, This is always going to be the numerator is for this ratio is going to be the molar mass. Which is given to us. Divided by the. Empirical formula. And if we do that here, we are going to get a hundred and fourteen point three. mass hopefully you're starting to remember what's carbon 12.01 and hydrogen is so we got 48.08 and 9.09 48.08 9.09, no, 48.04, yeah, so we get 57.13, right? 7.13, yeah. So that makes my multiplier, we don't have to grab a calculator. This has to be a whole number. We don't even need to punch this in. This is a two, right? We can just see that. So if that is a two, we've got C4H9. So this gets us a true molecular formula of C8H18. I think Al does quite a few of these right in the beginning, just quick doing a molecular formula, I'm pretty sure. Okay, two more problems here, and then we can go to chapter three. Um, 
here's an example using percentage composition. Got 24.3% carbon, 4.1% hydrogen. If this, these are the only three compounds, or excuse me, elements in the compound, then my chlorine should be 100 minus 24.3 minus 4.1. Does all three have to add up to 100? So that would be 71.6% chlorine. Okay. Step one is to get grams. Well, if you assume you got 100 grams of sample, you have 100 grams of sample, and these are the percentages, we can change all of these percents to grams, grams, grams. If you assume you have 100%, 100 grams of sample, then these grams match because percent means per 100. So we have grams. We're gonna convert everything to moles. We've got carbon. I have to line three of them up here. We're converting everything to moles. Okay, we got three sig figs. It doesn't hurt to keep a few extra numbers on this. So I'm going to keep a couple extra numbers on this. So step one, we got grams. We just changed our percents to grams. Step two, we convert everything to moles. Step three, five by the smallest, right? So here's where I grab a different color pen. It looked like the smallest is 2.01975, but it's very, very, very close to this. So the smallest is 2.01975, 2.01975, and 2.01975. For the carbon, one. 
hydrogen two and for the chlorine one. Oh, if you end up like a 1.33 or 1.25, it'll be pretty obvious. But at this point, if they look like they're pretty darn close to whole numbers, like if this is 0.997 or 1.01, .01, again, you'll know if you've got the 1.3, 1.25 or so. Okay. Oh, we got to go all the way on this. We need a molecular formula. So you can't get a molecular formula until you get an empirical formula. And our empirical formula now is C1, H2, Cl1. And you don't have to put the ones in, obviously. Now, we need to figure out our multiplier. And that is going to be ninety nine grams per mole given divided by one carbon, two hydrogens, and a chlorine. That comes out to be 0.5. Again, no reason to grab a calculator. 49. 49. One carbon plus two hydrogens plus a chlorine. And my multiplier here again is two. Plug this in, my final answer then is C2H4Cl2. C2H4Cl2. Okay, I'll set this one up. We'll get this one started. And I'm gonna let you finish this. We have percentages, so we're gonna make these grams, 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 grams. We're gonna line up four of these. Going to line up four of these. And I'll put these in and then I'm going to let you finish this baby off if you get a chance. So we've got 24.31, 28.09, 1 1.01, .01, and 16. Let's 
So you have to do an empirical formula and then adopt the molecular formula, the same as the one up above. You got to, you have to do step four on this. This turns out to be a pretty big uh, compound. Okay, um, that'll get rid of, so we get through all part two. I forgot to finish though. Um, in our formulas of compounds, hydrates, right? The very, very last page under formulas of compounds. So we'll look at page eight first, our formulas of compounds, page eight. So I put these two on there right away. This one is gonna start with hydro, right? Because it does not have oxygen in it. So this should be hydro. phosphoric acid. And this is phosphate, so this should be phosphoric acid without the hydro. Did you catch that on page eight? Page eight, the answers for these are posted, right? Hydrophosphoric acid, phosphoric acid. And then on the very last page, hydrates. Hydrates just have water locked in them. To indicate the waters, we use a multiplication dot. So we have calcium sulfate. We write calcium sulfate like we would. Ca plus two. SO4 minus two. The number of waters attached is represented by a multiplication dot. Same prefixes, fry, and hydrate is just H2O. Everything is the same. We just use a multiplication dot and we tell how many waters are attached to each uh, formula unit here. Now, when you have lab this week, you do the molar mass, you include the waters. So this would be calcium plus sulfur plus four oxides plus six hydrogens plus three waters. If you have lab this, well, you have lab this week. When you calculate the molar mass, you include the waters. So if I went down to number two here, would be copper. I would need Roman numerals. SO4 is sulfate. And sulfate is minus two. So we would have copper two sulfate. Five would be enta. Two O is just hydrate. And if you did the molar mass of this, you would have to include the the H two O's here. It would be 10 hydrogens plus five oxygen in the molar mass. Okay, that concludes chapter two. That allows you to do four, 18, 38. Those are just three hydrate questions.
So you should be able to complete everything on this, on both quizzes. And both quizzes we have down for tomorrow night at midnight, I think, right? Pretty sure tomorrow night at midnight. Okay, that gets us to chapter three, learning guide. Gets us to talk about what we're going to do in lab this week as well. So now we know how to write formulas of compounds. We're going to put those formulas of compounds into reactions. And then in those reactions, we get to start calculating some stoichiometry, grams, moles, all that stuff, right? So the first thing we do with reactions is to make sure that we can balance equations. So we have reactants on the left. This arrow pretty much just means yields. You have products on the right. If we put the state of these, this would be a gas. This would be a G for a gas. This would be a G for a gas. And then depending upon how you do this, this water could be a gas or a liquid. Now, unfortunately on a typewriter or a word processor, that L looks like this. It kind of looks like a one. So use the I type stuff in and I put a cursive L like this for liquid. So we can get liquid water out of this. So we've got reactants on the left, products on the right, separated by our plus signs. And to balance that, because we are going to balance our equation to make sure requirement, the equation must satisfy to be consistent with the law of conservation of matter. Balancing is a shorthand way to write these out. This is a carbon, hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. Notice this is just natural gas burning. It combines with O2 from the air, oxygen, 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 oxygen. O2, the O2 that we breathe is a diatomic molecule, two oxygens hooked together. And we are going to get carbon dioxide, CO2, and we are going to get water. Now, it's going to be coming up next month or soon when people start their furnaces up for the first time. If the oxygen input to the furnace or something happens, there's bees that build nests in there, something like that. If it does not get enough oxygen, it will produce carbon monoxide and not carbon dioxide. Hopefully, if you are in a rental place, you have a carbon monoxide detector. They're really cheap now. Hopefully, your smoke and carbon monoxide detector, it does both, I'm hoping. All right, let's turn the page. We're gonna balance equations here. Some of you are really good at this. If you need more practice, I have some practice ones out in Canvas. So this is the order you should do this in. It makes it really pretty fast. Compounds that have polyatomic ions. So. Do you have nitrates? Do you have phosphates? Some kind of polyatomic ion.
And then we look at metals next. Know that our metals are to the left of the staircase line here. Over this way. So we do metals next. Then we would do non-metals except hydrogen and oxygen. Then hydrogen and oxygen. Do oxygen last. It's going to be your highest number nine times out of 10. Okay. Let's do this. Write a balanced equation for the reaction of molecular nitrogen and oxygen to form dinitrogen pentoxide. So we've got, I'm going to put it up here. We've got N2 plus O2, and we're going to produce N2O5. Step one, do we have any parentheses with polyatomic ions? No. Do we have any metals? No. Non-metals. Stay away from hydrogen and oxygen. We would do nitrogen first. How many nitrogens? We have two on the reactant side. We have two on the product side. Two and two is good to go. Then we're going to look at oxygen. Two and five, least common multiple is 10, huh? So we're going to go two here, five here, which also means we have to two there. So here's, we really have this, right? We have N2 plus N2 plus O2 plus O2 plus O2 plus O2 plus O2. We have N2O5 plus N2O5. Ooh, I better zoom that back out now, right? That's what we have. Now, you can always do addition to substitute for multiplication, correct? So we multiply all the time. How many total nitrogen atoms? Two times two is four. Two plus two is four. Five times two is 10 on the oxygen. Five times two, we've got 10 oxygen. We always multiply or two plus two plus two plus two plus two is 10. We have two times two, we have four nitrogens, and we have two times five, we have 10 oxygen. That is balanced on both sides. Okay, let's do this one. C2H6 plus O2. Where are we going to start? Where are we going to start? Don't have any parentheses. We don't have any metals. We're going to do carbon first, right? Do hydrogen and oxygen last. We'll do carbon first. Got two carbons here, one carbon here. We need to put a two here. Now we should do hydrogen next. Three hydrogen here. Two hydrogen here. So we can put a three here. That gives me my six hydrogen. Now we need to look at oxygen. How many total oxygen on the right? Total oxygen on the right. Seven. Right, three times one, we got three here plus six. Oh, four, three plus four is seven. Sometimes you'll see a three and a half here, not very often. We need to get an even number. When this happens, double everything and come back to here. We're gonna double everything to make our oxygens even.
So now we have six plus eight, we have 14, we need a seven here. The next one has polyatomic ions in it. Here's acetate here and acetate here. We're going to balance them as one unit, and that's going to take care of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen all together. So with this four, there's four acetates here. There's only one over here. So we're going to put a four here. So we want to do that first, polyatomic ions. Now, what should we do next? Metals. We already changed sodium right here. Sodium is a metal. So let's fix it up right here. We have four sodiums here. Two here. We put two there. Now let's do look at lead is a metal. We've got one lead and one lead. And that seems to do it. We've got two sulfur and two sulfur. The next one, we have polyatomic hydroxide, polyatomic hydroxide. We've got polyatomic ammonium and we have polyatomic phosphate. Actually makes it easier. So for sure, we are going to look at these polyatomic ions first. Um, doesn't matter where we start. I'm looking at, we have OH with a two. We put a two here, but the NH4, if we put a two there, this NH4 already has a three. And then I'm glancing at the PO4 has a two, PO4 here is only a one. Probably the best thing to do is to do this PO4 first by putting a two there. That makes our NH4 six. So we're gonna put a six here. And then our OH is a six. There's two OHs here. So we would put a three. All right, go ahead and try that one. Everybody try that one. Try that one.
do 15, 10, 12. It gets pretty ugly. Thirty two oxygens. Thirty two oxygen on both sides on that. It's kind of ugly. Okay, let's go to the next page. This is going to get us into talking about the lab that starts this afternoon for some of you in here. Okay, I'm going to come back and talk about this reversible reaction a little bit. Now, we're going to talk about dissolving things in water. If we say that something dissolves, we say that it is soluble. So when substances are dissolved in water, they undergo either a physical or a chemical change that yields ions in solution. These substances constitute, constitute an important class of compounds called electrolytes. Substances that do not yield ions when dissolved are called non-electrolytes. If the physical or chemical process that generates the ions is essentially 100% efficient, all of the dissolved compound yields ions. Then the substance is known as a strong electrolyte. If only a relatively small fraction of the dissolved substances undergoes the ion producing process, it is called a weak electrolyte. Ionic electrolytes. The figure shows a dissolvent of KCl. Next page, KCl. And this really is KCl solid going to KCl aqueous, if we're adding water to this. But really, this is potassium split up and the chloride splits up. Now, this is no different than table salt. It's the same thing. You can see a bunch of sodium chlorides hooked together with the naked eye, right? You can see, and they're a perfect crystal, by the way. They're a perfect cube. You can see this with the naked eye. When water comes in and surrounds them and pulls them apart, this dissolves. If water can pull these apart, we say that it is soluble or it dissolves. If water cannot pull the positive and negative charges, which are attracted to each other apart, it doesn't dissolve. It's that simple. If something dissolves, we're saying in water at least, we're saying that water has the ability to pull the bonds that make up the crystal structure apart. If it is an ionic compound, we're gonna get ions like this. If it's sugar, we're not gonna get all these charges. It's just gonna pull different sugar molecules away and it's gonna mix within the clear water and it becomes invisible. You see a perfectly clear solution. Can you get this crystalline solid back? You can, right? Just let the water evaporate, right? We'll speed that process up in some of our labs because we'll just heat it up. So if we get and we can measure. The old way to do this is to actually put a light bulb in here, separate the positive and negative of your plug-in, put it in solution and to see if the light bulb lights up. In lab, we're gonna actually use conductivity probes. So it makes it a little bit safer, a lot safer. 
And that conductivity probe is just measuring how many ions are in this solution. We know that ionic compounds, if they dissolve, are going to produce a lot of ions in solution. Lots of ions. An example of that is going to be NaCl of one could be hydrochloric acid, which means we're just going to get all of this is going to separate into Na pluses and Cl minus. You are going to get lots of ions in solution. That is a strong electrolyte. The light bulb is going to light up a lot. Your conductivity probe in lab is going to show a high number. If you get few ions in solution, an example of that is vinegar. And no ions in solution would be glucose, sucrose, sugar, C12, C6H1206. This right here shows the dissolving of copper two chloride. But what I need to point out is look at the orientation of the water. We say that water is polar. So water does not share, I should gotta, I gotta clarify that a little bit better. So if I put it like this, it looks like Mickey Mouse, right? Where the Mickey Mouse ears have to be hydrogen, right? So we're going to talk about this in a later chapter. We know that the formula for water is H2O. It's that simple for now. What you see there, there's an electron here for hydrogen. There's an electron here for oxygen. There's an electron here for this hydrogen. And there's an electron here for this oxygen. If they share those electrons that make that bond right down the middle, perfectly share it, everybody's happy, then we don't get these charges that we have made on our pink sheet. However, oxygen pulls that electron towards itself. It pulls these pair of bonding electrons towards itself. So oxygen takes the electrons, takes more of the electrons towards itself. So the oxygen is partially negative and that makes the hydrogens positive. Let me summarize that. It's just not an equal sharing of the electrons. Oxygen pulls the electrons towards itself. The oxygen is more negative and the hydrogen is more positive. So then we know that the positives of the hydrogens are gonna be attracted to the negative chlorides in the negatives of the oxygens are gonna be attracted to the positive ions. Again, if water has the ability to split up this attractive force between the positive and negative ions, we say that it dissolves. If not, it does not dissolve. Now, there's a kind of a complicated chart or a complicated, what do I want to say, rules. It looks like this on page nine, and this is straight out of the textbook. Soluble compounds, almost, notice the word almost, almost, most here, right? There's so many exceptions. 
just so many exceptions with chemistry because you can never trust an electron. Then there's exceptions. So at the very end, there's a pretty nice table that I stole from somewhere. And it actually tells you whether or not it is soluble or insoluble. But you're still supposed to refer to that chart from the book. Otherwise, the back side of the pink sheet has my cheater solubility grid as well. It looks like this on the back side of my pink sheet. So if you want to know if calcium, calcium chromate dissolves, it does because there's aqueous there. If it does not dissolve, if water does not have the ability to pull the positive and negative ion apart, we say it stays a solid. And that's the example with calcium hydroxide. <clears throat> Again, if it's aqueous in here on this chart, water has the ability to overpower the attractive force between the positive and the negative ion. You are going to get lots of ions in solution, and it is going to conduct electricity. Here's kind of a flow chart here. Aqueous ions or solutions, aqueous solutions mean in water. You have an ionic compound. How do you know if you have an ionic compound? It starts with a metal ion. Think of NaCl. You're going to get lots of ions in solution. If you have a molecular compound, it's going to be made up of nonmetals. Nonmetals still make up our acids. In our acids, we have weak or strong acids. Strong acids. This is all of them right there. We know these are strong. You are going to get lots of ions in solution for acids. What's the ion going to be? H plus. Weak acid, think vinegar. And then molecular compounds. So that's what we'll talk about in lab then is just electrolytes. Do you get lots of ions in solution? Do you get lots of ions in solution? You can finish up all the other two quizzes. Otherwise, you should be able to balance out one through four on the new quiz. Hopefully you've got this printed out, chapter three. When we get done with chapter three, we have test one, which I believe is scheduled on October 10, I believe. That's correct.
All right, we will see you on Wednesday. Make sure you complete your OWL, get that in. Remember, you have to hit the submit button in OWL, right? And then it drops it into Canvas.